guys and, and, and ladies, and kids. Richard and hopefully uh, Dixie, she's kind of impaired right now. She's having a back issue. Hopefully she'll be up and running again. We want to start passing out, and Richard will have to explain maps to you. We're going to start passing out a lot of flyers <laughs> that are back there. We have thousands, and we have maps that are very coordinated to get to the streets here. And if you can go out on your own, you say, hey, my boyfriend and I, my husband and I, my girlfriend and I, my family and I, we'll go and we'll do a couple streets. We can make that happen too. We've got a couple months to be able to get all of these out. And so Richard's going to explain that on Saturday morning at 9 o'clock. Like I said, if you want to come for breakfast, that would be great. Then the next Saturday, uh, a friend of Betty and I's, who's written a really good book, uh, although Jan said she ought to change the title of it, but it's If God Can Find David, and it is, it is a good read. Everybody that has read it has said it is a good read. She has got an amazing story. She uh, started out life being married to a Muslim. It didn't, that didn't go so well. And uh, she's got, she has got a story. Ladies, listen. We have about, I think, 18 or so signed up. We need to know how many people are coming. You are more than welcome to invite as many women as you can gather together. Uh, because I think, especially people who are going through some things in their marriage and relationship, God's going to do some things. This lady's got a message. Man, she can preach too. So if you would, make sure you email Miss Betty. Let her know that you're going to be there. Lasso some people and bring them with you. Amen? Amen. That is, what time Saturday, Betty? 11.30. 11.30. And lunch will be provided. So double whammy. Huh? Next Saturday, right. Next Saturday, the 11th. Yes, the 11th. Man, what a memory, like a rusty steel trap. Saturday, April, or May 11th. So we want you to come, bring your young ladies, bring your old ladies. That doesn't sound right. Bring your young ladies, and you're not quite as young ladies, with you. But make sure Miss Betty knows, because she needs to be able to order the right amount of food. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now let's say amen to our kids and push them out of here. We have um, we've got a lesson this morning that I think is going to be a little bit unusual. Everybody in here born again. Everybody know Jesus in here. Y'all have a relationship with him. I, now, I'm not, I'm not talking about that you go to church. Okay? Do you have a relationship with Jesus? Do you have a loving relationship with Jesus? Have you sat in his lap and gotten embraced by him? All right. Then we've got a good lesson for you this morning because I want, to, I want to help you enhance that, better that, and improve your life, if that'd be all right. All right. And I'm, and, and I'm kind of in a teachy mood this morning, so forgive me if, if I don't shout and jump across pews or something. You did something different with your hair, too. Yeah. All right. It's cute. Betty and I went down to Tennessee for a few days, kind of wrap our brains around a few things. I had a few things I just wanted to think about, and I need to be out of Cincinnati in cold weather, in rain, in gray skies. I think the Lord's calling us to the mountains of Tennessee as a church. You going with me? You, you just about got it. You got worse down. 
All right. Um, and it's interesting what you observe if you go to other places and you see other things and just kind of get your brain loose for a little bit and, and get to see some things. And I, I always think better if, if I'm away from everything. I, I just think, and my brain goes wild. You'd have to be in my brain for about 10 seconds to understand that ADD is a minor symptom. Okay? Um, but I've been thinking about some things within the body of Christ and praying on them and asking the Lord to give me some, some understanding. Some of which you have heard over the last few weeks when we're talking about the weapons of our warfare. Because I do feel that the church, the body of Christ, is under a lot of attack. And the unfortunate thing is, is we have no idea how to combat many of the things. Thus, a lot of the body of Christ has turned to... Uh, I don't have a better way of saying it, and, and sometimes I get a little bit crude or a little bit brash, maybe. Um, maybe even a little insensitive. Just live with me, because I love you all, and, and I'm hoping you love me, okay? But pharmakia is a word in Scripture that means... Um, we get our word pharmacy from it. And pharmakia is, in ancient times, a form of witchcraft. That make you feel good about your pharmacist, right? Um, um, yeah, don't, don't go home and tell your son this story, Rick. Um, but so much of the church has turned to a secular form of dealing with things. So thus, in, in churches, we have set up, in, in a lot of places, professional counseling organizations within the church. Now, I'm not opposed to counseling. Don't anybody think that? I've done a lot of it um, through the years that I've been a, a, a pastor and, and involved in ministry. Um, not on the receiving end, on the giving end. And, and there are times that I need somebody that I can sit with and say, hey, why is this happening? And just vent with and blow up. You know what I mean? And, and it, for them to just sit there and say, mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. Now tell me what you feel, mm-hmm. You need some of them every now and then, right? But that isn't God's best and it isn't his answer. Drugs are not his best, and they're not his answer. Medical treatments for everything under the sun is not God's best and not his answer. Much of the body of Christ suffers from depression. Much of the body of Christ suffers from a lot of other things that are Intake related. Heart disease. Diabetes. Um, a lot of COPD. A lot of blood disorders. Sugars and all those things. Yeah, it, and it's, it's a plague almost. Now, if we could learn what the ancients knew about how to live life, in particular, how to live life under the glory of the Almighty Creator, I think we could change our life a lot. I think we could put ourselves in a different situation. That being said, let me give you a little bit of information from some secular writers. From an article published in the Harvard Medical School, uh, in the Harvard Mahoney Neuroscience Institute letter. It is big. Scientists gave little thought to the neurological effects of dance 
until relatively recently. Which is confounding, by the way. If you have watched any movies about people in Africa, about the American Indian, about gypsies, about Italians, about Spaniards, all of them have dance in them. Why have we just started studying about dance in recent years and its effect on humanity? We have studied about horse flies. We have studied about maggots. We have studied about moles. We have studied about so many things that are so insignificant to life as a human being and to find out how it affects us. And a lot of the studies come back and they say, it has no effect on humanity. And yet, something like this that almost everybody has done at some point in time in, in their life, we don't study. I read on because I digressed. <laughs> when researchers began to investigate the complex mental coordination that dance requires, in a 2008 article in Scientific American magazine, a Columbia University neuroscientist posited that synchronizing music and movement, dance, essentially constitutes a double pleasure. Oh, man. You can come to church and have, not double mint, you can have double pleasure in dance and in music. Music stimulates the brain's reward centers while dance activates its sensory and motor circuits. Why do we have worship? Why do we have music in church? Why is it good that we have all the musicians and all the singers and all that we have going on up here? Why is that important? Well, we're getting stimulated. Now, on lifehack.org, Re Rebecca Barris writes this. Five things that will happen to your brain when you dance. It'll, in, in, it'll enhance neuroplasticity. Get this. People who dance once a week, one time a week, they dance. They have a 76% reduced risk of dementia. <laughs> wow! They looked at golf, they looked at hiking, they looked at bicycling, and I think they were reading, and one other thing. Nothing even came close. Long-term study, too. Nothing even came close to dancing. 76% reduction. Wow, everybody's up dancing right now. <laughs> It'll make you more intelligent because of the things that fires off in your brain. It'll slow down aging and boost memory. Brother Jim, you about ready to get up and dance, right, brother? <laughs> it'll improve your muscle memory. And it'll help prevent dizziness. In one study, they, they checked out 20 professional ballet dancers and compared them to 20 rowers. The reason why they did that is because of the body mass index that both had, the amount of education that both had, and, and the amount of muscles that they use in both things. In the, in the, uh, the test, or the, the study groups, they followed them for a long time, put them through all kinds of neurological examinations and stuff. And what was interesting is that the ballet dancers had an incredible uh, ability to not get dizzy. Not ever. Doing anything. They spun them around and everything. And the ballet dancers were. Whoosh, whoosh, and they were ready. The boaters were throwing up. Now both were in great physical conditions. Or rowers. They, both were in great physical condition. But something gets trained. When you dance. That. Helps this dizziness thing. 
Her conclusion, dance can be a great way to maintain and improve many of your brain functions. Dance can increase your neural connectivity because it integrates several brain, brain functions at once. Rationale, musical, kinesthetic, and emotional. This increased neural connectivity can be of great benefit to your brain as it ages. So dance now and dance often. In another article published in the University of Helsinki's newsletter from their medical college, a, a grad student by the name of Hannah uh, Porkonen, she writes, her, she was doing her thesis on the effects of dance on the brain. She says, we do know that in dance, the basic elements of humanity combine in a natural way. It combines creative act, fine-tuned movement, and collaboration, much like playing music. The movement involves the whole body like in sports. There is touch like in gentle interaction. Dancing is also associated with flow, a well-researched phenomenon in which the person becomes fully immersed in an activity. Listen to that. Hmm, I'll get to that point in a minute. Flow experiences have been found to increase the general contentment and productivity of the person as well as the quality of the activity. It reduces the activation of the neural network, which is responsible for logical deduction in detailed observation. This makes room for the creative neural network, which also has an important role in generating a relaxed state of mind. That is right brain, left brain. Dancing shuts down the logical part, the thinking part, the analytical part, the part that is going to reason out why you can't believe something, which is left brain. It stimulates the right brain, the creative force of your mind that opens up faith. It opens up faith. Hallelujah. It opens up belief. Why do we want you to worship like a bunch of wild, crazy people? We want you to have faith. Amen. We want you to have the image maker, your brain, expanded in such a way that you... you Begin to pull down things that you can't pull down. Now, let me take you to, let's, take, let's go to Exodus. I want to give you two of the most famous dance verses in Scripture. Exodus chapter 15. Exodus chapter 15. Verses 20 through 21. Children of Israel cross the Red or, yeah, they cross the Red Sea. <sighs> Waters on either side. Crash in. Kill all the Egyptians. Moses, afterwards, after they get to the other side, they look back. The Egyptians are gone. Moses sings a song, commonly known as the Song of Moses. Afterwards, his sister Miriam, who's a prophetess, she does this. Then Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took the timbrel in her hand, and all the women went out with her with timbrels and with dance. And Miriam answered them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider has been thrown into the sea. Now these ladies followed uh, the, the, uh, the children of Israel, and, and they had some in the front, some in the back, and they're all singing, and they're singing this little chorus because Moses had sang this whole song with verses and chorus. And she comes up and she grabs a hold of the chorus. And she starts singing it. The horse and the rider have been thrown into the sea. And she's dancing around with a timbrel. Tambourine. And she's going at it. All of, of Israel goes into this euphoric state of victory. It has to do with them in being in a place of worship, praise, thanksgiving. Now, if you go to 1 Chronicles 15, 27 through 29, 
run into this guy named David. Little sheep herder. Never been to college. Likely didn't even go to elementary school. He spent all of his time out with the sheep and the Lord. And he learns a few things from God. One thing he learns is that God appreciates praise. God appreciates praise. Not only does he appreciate praise, he connects to praise. Remember what I was talking about that that lady wrote? The connectivity? There is something that connects us together in praise. Particularly in dance and praise music at the same time people connect together and things happen what's really interesting is what we read about David here David was clothed with robe and fine linen as were the Levites who bore the ark the singers and Chenaniah the music master with the singers So Steve was out in front with the singers. David was wearing a linen ephod. How many of you have ever worn linen? Now, is linen real thick? The color for linen back then was white. David had a linen ephod on, which means he had like a linen white gown on. That's it. (laughs) Rutro was right. (laughs) And David is walking in front as they bring the Ark of the Covenant in because they went, they had heard that the Ark of the Covenant had blessed the house of Obed Edom way beyond measure. And so David goes and he says, Wait a minute, we can't have Obed Edom getting all the blessing. Bring that thing. It belongs here. Go get it. So they go get it, and they retrieve it, and they bring it back. As they're bringing it back, and it enters the gates of Jerusalem, David meets them. David goes out in front, and he's dancing along. Look what it says. Thus all Israel brought up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the horn, with trumpets and with the cymbals, making music with stringed instruments and harps. And it happened as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came to the city of David that Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David whirling, and, in other words, dancing, and playing music, and she despised him in her heart. Now there's a great lesson in this because Michael did, hadn't learned a whole lot. Even though she was brought up in King Saul's house. Even though she would have been uh, schooled by the priest. And she would have had a, a foundation in Judaism well enough to understand a lot of things about God. She looks out and she sees her husband dancing and leaping in a linen ephod. A white linen ephod. Jockey had not been made a company then. And he's dancing around and jumping and leaping. What makes matters worse, when you go to 1 Samuel and you read the account, David stripped off the linen ephod. And he did have on a loincloth. Thank you, Jesus. And he was dancing and leaping. And I'm not sure the linen ephod or the linen loincloth covered everything. But there's David leaping through. She looks out at David. She sees all of the handmaidens who are dancing along with him. And they're looking. And they're looking at the king. And he stripped off his garments and became, as David said, I will become more abased than this. I will get down to the nitty gritty because I am willing to strip off everything that represents anything about who I am, what I am, my position and everything so that I can worship the Lord. Michael, on the other hand, watching from a window. I think these two represent very clearly two different types of believers. One type of believer who was willing to sit in the window and watch God. Watch what God does. Watch the the church. Watch the, the body of Christ move and do. 
Watch things that happen. Watch prayer. Watch worship. Watch it all. And the other one who said, with reckless abandon, I will dive headlong into it all. Forget anything else. I'm going to worship the Lord. And he tells his wife, I'm going to worship him. You ain't seen nothing yet, baby. He starts something in, in Israel from that point on where their worship becomes incredible. They begin to publish the Psalms of David so that everybody in the kingdom can read them. Along with the melody. So the people were singing them. And the people were singing the songs all the time. The incredible thing is the kingdom starts to grow. And grow. And grow. Their enemies won't even attack them because they're afraid of them. What they hear from Israel constantly is praise. Were there problems in the kingdom? Yeah, David had eight wives. He had a lot of problems. He made lots of mistakes along the road. But the worship and the praise overcame them all because it always continually took them back to God, took them back to their relationship, took them back to where they were before him. And they saw themselves. Listen, we're just, we're just here in our linen ephod that we'll strip off gladly to worship you because we really aren't anything compared to you. And they laid out their hearts before him. And God prospered that kingdom like nothing the world has ever seen. Not then, not even now. People say, well, pastor, what about the United States? That's awful prosperous. Listen, we don't have a thimble of the wealth that Israel had in that day. Now, God is in the movement. Things happen. Remember the part I read about how it stirs up the creative part? The right brain part? Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Guess what that word hovering is? Pretty much. It, it's in the root of dance. It's a uh, raka, Greek word or Hebrew word. And what it means is to flutter. To, um, some of us have expressed it this way. Um, is when a bird hovers over its chicks, it's it's fluttering its wings and it's kind of dancing around to keep off all the stuff brooding over. When the Spirit of God is moving across the face of the waters, I think sometimes we think this little dove comes down and whoosh, soars across the water, gives a wink at the water and light becomes light. The word hovering over, though, gives us a different understanding when we look at it. Because it really means the Spirit of God was going over the waters and it was, it was moving. It was moving everything. On the day of Pentecost, when they were all sitting in the upper room and the tongues of fire came down and lit on the heads of the disciples as they stood there 120 strong waiting for the promise of the Spirit. And they're there and they're waiting. All of a sudden, it says that the cloven tongues of fire came. It, it's not like it came and just sat still on their heads. Uh-uh. It was on their heads and it was... The sound of a mush, rushing, I almost said mushing, righty wind. Rushing, mighty wind came into the place. What did they do? Started speaking in tongues, and then they went outside. 
When they went outside, the people looked at them coming down and said, Oh, look at these guys. It's early in the morning and they're already loaded. They're already drunk. Well, you don't know when people thought that. Yes, it says it. And then Peter clarifies it. Hey, these guys are not drunk as you suppose. But this is that which was promised by the prophet Joel. And he recites the prophecy to them. And they, people were amazed. What do drunk people do? They stagger around. I can tell you what I did when I was drunk. I thought I could dance. <laughs> Two left feet and no rhythm. But when I was drunk, buddy, I was Michael Jackson. <laughs> Betty and I entered a dance contest. In her, it was her senior year. She said, we got to win this. It was a 50s dance. And so it was a sock hop thing, you know. And so we show up. I got my hair slicked back. I'm ready to go. The only problem was, I don't dance. Can't dance. So Betty says, come on, I'll teach you. She taught me a few things. She said, just follow my steps. So this is how we danced. I'm holding on to her. Got her here. She's got my hand. She's counting. One, two, three, four. And I'm watching her feet. As we go. I'm not having fun. I'm in deep concentration. On what's going on with those feet. So I can follow them along. Somehow amazingly. I think it's because she's beautiful. We won. It wasn't because I could dance. But I started thinking about that. What if. We taught our children to dance before the Lord. What if we taught our children to be excited, jump around, dance, leap, shout with joy, spin, do all of those things that we did as kids? Jesus said this, unless you become as little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. What was he talking about? We just follow along blindly like a little kid. Yes, mom. Yes, dad. No, no. He's talking about us. In our character and our action, being like little children, moving along. Now, I want to show you perhaps the most famous clips that speak to why we should be doing this in church. Jackie, can you play that? People dance for a number of reasons. They danced in prayer or saw that their crops would be plentiful or so their hunt would be good. And they dance to stay physically fit and show their community spirit. And they dance to celebrate. And that, that is the dancing that we're talking about. Yeah. Aren't we told? In, in Psalm 149, praise ye the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song. Let them praise his name in the dance. Amen. It was King David. King David, who, who we read about in, in Samuel. And, and, and what did David do? What did David do? What did David do? David <laughs> danced before the Lord with all his might. Leaping Leaping and dancing before the Lord. Leaping and dancing. And Ecclesiastes assures us that there is a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to laugh. And a time to weep. A time to mourn. And there is a time to dance. No 
was a time for this law, but not anymore. See, this is our time to dance. It is our way of, of celebrating life. It's the way it was in the beginning. It's the way it's always been. It's the way it should be now. There you go. Now, I know that was footloose. But you know, the dancing and rejoicing in the Lord has been all but banned completely in so many places. A lot of churches have banned it. And the Bible says that we ought to dance before the Lord. We ought to dance. We ought to celebrate. Who has something to celebrate if not us? Who has something to rejoice about? If not us. See, in Luke chapter 6, during the Beatitudes, Jesus says this. He lift, then he lifted up his eyes toward his disciples and said, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Now listen to this. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. You know what the answer to the enemy's attack on your life is? Leaping for joy. Dancing around. Being excited about who God is. Twirling and leaping. He says... For indeed, your reward is great in heaven. For in like manner their fathers did to the prophets. You see, many people have persecuted the, the cause of Christ, the word of Christ, the message. For a long time they've persecuted and tried to put it down. And the church so oftentimes does what the church does. It shuts up. It clams up. It doesn't do what it's supposed to do. It doesn't enjoy life. You know what we were called to do? Enjoy. Enjoy. We were called to enjoy all that God gave us. How do we enjoy it? Yeah, that was really good. God is great. God is good. And somebody else says, all the time. All the time. I mean, go to sleep. We are supposed to take in all that God has given us. Enjoy what he has given us. And dance and leap and shout. Jump. See the goodness of the Lord. See his pleasure. See what he does with his people. Because it's amazing. He quoted Ecclesiastes. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. And I do think it's our time. In Psalm 30, verses 11 and 12, it says this, You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You know why people mourn? They lost something. Mourning isn't just because your spouse dies or child dies or your parents die. Some friend close to you passes away, so you go into mourning. Mourning isn't just for that. Mourning is a loss of anything. Mourning is when um, I, I've seen people coming home from a Bengals game and they were all mourning. I don't want to pick on just the Bengals. I've seen the same thing with the Reds. People, when, when they lose something, and they, it, this, is, this is a strange thing, but we were watching a program, Betty and I, we were watching this program, and there was a psychologist, he was talking about the psychology of sports, spectators, with sports. One of the things that he said in there is, he said, if you listen to people, people 
throw themselves into a relationship with teams that don't even know they exist. So when the team loses and somebody says, hey, what happened today? Oh, we lost. Uh, We didn't do anything unless you were a mouse in the pocket of that player out there. They lost. We didn't. And, And people would get all caught up in that and they make that their life and they'll cheer and they'll jump and they'll they'll shout God calls us God calls us to be in him in Christ to the extent that our connection emotionally physically neurologically is all caught up in him so that our response to loss is not mourning. Our response to loss is dancing. Our response to something persecuting us, coming against us, is, is shouts and dance. Our response to the enemy is, is us dancing around, declaring his goodness, declaring what he's done, who he's done it with, and declaring what he's putting over us. He says he sings over us. He sings over us. The Lord God Almighty of heaven sings over us. Now that word sing in in the Hebrew isn't just that God is singing. Like he's standing back in some far out cloud and he sees a little herd of believers down there and he starts singing over you. God comes down and he is dancing around you. In song. He is inhabiting your space. He is moving around you on your behalf. Well, I wish God would move. Man, when's God going to move? Man, we're praying for God to move. Listen, God is moving 100% of the time. All the time, God is always in movement. That's why the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the deep. God wasn't going to stand still for anything that wasn't producing life. God doesn't stand still over us. God moves around us, over us. He declares His Word into us. And all the time, He's encircling us with His movement, His action, His energy. And He's singing over us with gladness. And we... I wish God would move. Well, he is moving. He is pursuing us. He is after us. He is chasing us. God's heart, the entirety of his heart, is grabbing a hold of us. And he's saying, come dance with me. Come sing with me. Come walk with me. Come talk with me. Talk about the people. What do you think Enoch did? Think Enoch's walking along? Thank you for walking with me today, God. (laughs) Enoch is walking with God. It says his relationship with the Lord was such that God showed him unfathomable things. And it says Enoch walked with God. The word walk there doesn't mean we're taking a slow, leisurely stroll. It means we are walking as friends. Man, there is some strut in our step. He walked with God and he was and then he was not. I want to show you one more scripture here. Well, let me finish Psalm 30. You have turned for me my morning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness. To the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Now in Luke, uh, chapter 10, verses 17 through 24, the 70 are sent out, and they go out there, and they do all kinds of things. And I talked a little bit about that in the last several weeks. And they come back, and they come back with joy. Now the word joy there means they were happy. They were happy. They're high-fiving it. Man, look what we did. Oh, yeah, you think you did that? Listen. I cast seven demons out of one lady. One of the other guys, seven? I did 12. 
They were excited. They were happy. But I want you to see the difference here. Jesus says, I saw lightning from heaven. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice. Don't just be happy in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. You know what he's telling them? Hey, don't just be happy. Man, jump around, leap. Get excited because your names are written in heaven. You ought to be leaping and dancing and shouting because your names are written down. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit. Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit. It's the same word used. He's, Jesus told them, you ought to be jumping and shouting and leaping and dancing. And then he went and did it. Because of what he saw them able to do. And that they were getting it. Man, I don't know about you. I don't want to be in church. Where we're all sitting there thinking. (laughs) Church should be an event. It should be something that radically so changes your life this week to next week that you're consumed. Consumed by the message, consumed by the worship, that when you come in and the people, one of these articles that I read, it says that there is a connectivity between people who dance together. That's why people are afraid of it. That's why churches are afraid of it. I mean, what happens if their youth start dancing together? Boys and girls. What happens if we teach them what dancing is about? What happens if we show them how they can pull down heaven and in the midst of the presence of God see their friends get saved? See the cutters in their school quit cutting. See the depressed kids quit being depressed. Seeing the kids who are using quit using. See kids going back to their homes telling their parents, Mom and Dad, you need, you need to quit smoking that stuff. I want to show you a better way. I want to love you enough to show you a better way. Mom and dad, listen, you don't need to get divorced. Come with me. I want to take you to church. I want to show you a better way. Church, we don't want to go to church. What are we going to do at church? We're going to dance. We're going to shout. We're going to declare what God is doing in the earth. And we're going to see his glory. Parents will go, what kind of stuff have you been smoking? Nope. I've been in the presence of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. There's a time to dance. We have a mighty weapon of our warfare that is out here for us. It is out here for us. It is out here for us to enjoy and to experience and to defeat our enemy. I told you before, Betty and I had a an old friend we used to go to church with. He was mailman, severely depressed. His son would, was in youth group with Bridget and, and Brad, and he would talk all the time about how his dad was. One day they decided they weren't going to put up with it anymore. He had been on all kinds of meds and all that to kind of lift his spirits. Pharmacia ransacked his house. His wife said, I've had enough. We're not going to do it anymore. We're going to go, and we're going to do what the Word says. She put on some hop, skip, and jump Christian music, you know, some moving stuff. She said, told him, get up. You're going to dance. Get up. You're going to dance. He eventually got up. They started dancing around. They've been dancing ever since. He has no depression anymore because he chased it away. 
he chased it away in the dance. Think God hasn't given us some things? They're just now studying it. And we've known all along the answer to our life, to our joy. Dance. Shout about the Lord. Amen? Let's stand to our feet this morning. Man, it is enough for me that Jesus dances over me. It's enough for me to know that the Lord takes pleasure in my dance. He takes pleasure in a guy with two left feet and no rhythm. Making a bounce, a skip, anything. Getting excited. Shouting. Raising your hands. Some of the weirdest things I've ever seen have been in church. We used to go to church with this lady and she would get out and she'd be out in the middle of the aisle doing worship and she'd go. It was the weirdest thing I'd ever seen. I think it even beat the guy that used to take his tie off and put it between his legs and put it behind his back and he would dance with his tie during our worship time. Or whatever floats your boat, you know. And, and I used to think, man, that is so weird. They, them people are weird. And then I started finding out there were all kinds of things in their lives that they were getting answered when they worshipped in all of their oddities and all of the strange things. God was responding to the pureness of their heart looking for answers and pulling him down. Come on, Lord, dance with me. Dance with me. Take my heart and dance with me. Man, you ain't never seen nothing till you've been in a, under a tent, 90 degrees and 90% humidity, with about 6,000 Africans who can't even move without bumping into each other. Dancing. And the ground shakes as they move up and down. And they're all in one accord, one harmony. I joke with the guy that was my, my guide, young guy named Elton. And I said, Elton, man, I, I'm overwhelmed. I, I, man, I, I don't even know what to think. I don't even know what to do. He, he looks at me with a straight face and he goes, oh, Reverend Fox, everybody knows white men can't dance. <laughs> and then he smiled with his big smile and he said, come on, bounce with me. Bounce with me. Listen, we can shout. We can shout. We can shout. Amen. We can shout, and we can dance, and we can turn the devil's projects inside out. Amen? Amen? Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, I can't wait to see you dance. Amen. Amen. If you don't know Jesus this morning, you can know him. You can know him. Just come up and talk to me. I'll introduce you. If you're here and you need prayer this morning for anything, lift your hand. We want to pray for you. You need prayer for anything. Brother Ron. All right. Brother, what's your name back there? Ricky? All right, Ricky. Brother Ricky in the back. Brother Ron right here. Who else? Was there somebody over here? You need prayer this morning. All right. Lay hands on Brother Ron right there. Hey, Bob, lay hands on him. He needs healing. Rick, go back here and lay hands on Ricky. Hey, Kevin, go over and lay hands on Ricky there and pray for him.
Now let's pray. Father, in the great and mighty name of the Lord Jesus. Father, we lift you up. Father, because we know Ron's lungs, Lord God, they need to be renewed, restored. Father, they need to be recreated inside of him, and he's been made a new creature in Christ. I pray, Father God, that you put a special endowment on, on his life, Father, on his entire being from head to toe, that he would feel the presence of the Lord God of heaven. No, Lord God, the recreative work that's happening inside of him. To know the goodness of God flowing through him, the richness.